Good morning, I'm Harley Schlanger from the LaRouche Organization with your daily update for July 14th, 2021. I keep getting questions from people who say, look, I appreciate your analysis, the updates you give, but I still don't understand why the LaRouche movement is so focused on the British and the idea of the British Empire and this idea of the special relationship. This is a thing of the past. Uh, aren't you blaming someone else for the errors of policy in the United States? Now, as, as you know, I'm not one to give a pass to the U.S. geopoliticians, but I think it's important to understand where the impetus for this is coming from and where the strategy was developed and who's continuing to push it. All you have to do is think about Thatcher's role in getting George H.W. Bush to invade Iraq in the early 90s, the role of Tony Blair to push George W. Bush, uh, Cameron pushing Obama on Libya. The, the British are at the center of these things, the role of the White Helmets in attacking the Syrian government of President Assad, the lies about Novichok coming from Porton Downs, the, the British uh, chemical warfare center. But I, I want to go back a little bit, take an event that happened yesterday to give you a, a, some insight into how this thing has worked over history. Uh, yesterday, British Defense Minister Ben Wallace was in the United States for meetings with his counterpart, General Lloyd Austin, who's now the Secretary of Defense of the United States. Uh, Austin is a former general and a board member of Raytheon, it was just reported yesterday that Raytheon is the second largest recipient of U.S. government money for defense, $42 billion in 2020. And so maybe that explains why General Austin was made the Secretary of Defense. Now, in their meeting yesterday, Austin praised the deployment by the British of the carrier strike group centered around the Queen Elizabeth II aircraft carrier, which is being sent to the South China Sea. And Austin said, quote, we are looking forward to working with the UK. And he added that its new integrated review aligns well with the priorities outlined in our own interim national security strategic guidance policy. So he's praising the British for coordinating their policy with us. So it sounds as though the British are responding to what the US wants. And Wallace, in response, just gushed about the special relationship. He said, sticking together is what it's all about. We go together to the Pacific. And then he said, the UK stands shoulder to shoulder with the US to make sure that British values and US values are held up and protected from whatever threats are thrown against them. So this is a celebration of the special relationship, the idea that the British will join the United States in the containment of China, which the British have identified as the greatest threat to the future of mankind, and which until recently was not seen that way in the United States until Mike Pompeo took control over U.S. foreign policy regarding China and made China the boogeyman for uh, the West and this was continued by comments by Blinken and uh, other top U.S. officials. And as a result, part of the impetus for the pushing up the timetable to leave Afghanistan was to carry out what Obama had called the Asian pivot, which is to leave behind the wars of the Middle East to be able to fight the wars in the Asia Pacific. So that's the background to this. Now, there's a continuity of British imperial strategy in terms of the United States adoption of it. This was acknowledged openly by two of the most important people in carrying this out. One was Henry Kissinger, who spoke at Chatham House, which is British intelligence, in 1978, saying that when he was Secretary of State, he often kept the British Foreign Office better briefed than his own administration and he often worked from British briefing papers, an open admission that the British were shaping the policy. Kissinger was followed by another geopolitician named Zbigniew Brzezinski, who we've covered recently in terms of the Afghan debacle and Brzezinski's role in setting this up 
30 years, actually 40 years from 1979 to the present, of U.S. involvement in strategic operations in Afghanistan, which included the war against the Soviet Union and then uh, the war in uh, American soldiers deployed after 2001. Brzezinski, in his book, The Grand Chessboard, says that his view was that of Sir Halford Mackinder, the founder of geopolitics, and they both said that the heartland is the issue, the Eurasian heartland, and that's how the U.S. policy was shaped by Brzezinski. Again, an admission it came from the British. Uh, the same thing was true with George Shultz and Madeleine Albright. Uh, again, a Republican, Schultz, Albright, a Democrat. Kissinger was nominally a Republican and, and Brzezinski a Democrat. And then again, most recently, Pompeo to Blinken. The same policy, regardless of the party. On foreign policy, the U.S. has been following the British lead. Now, what this represents is the idea that a unilateral power has the right to impose its rules. That's what geopolitics is. It's endless wars and endless confrontation between conflicting parties, which of course means huge budgets for the military industrial complex, uh, and also a diversion away from economic problems in the homeland. Now, at the same time, the other unity is on neoliberal economic policies, globalization, free trade, represented today by the efforts to move to the Great Reset, a global central banker's dictatorship. To do what? To impose a global Green New Deal of deindustrialization and population reduction. And there's bipartisan consensus for this in the United States uh, behind British imperial interests. Now, I, I want to read you some quotes that give you some insight into this. This is a book by a British degenerate named Christopher Hitchens. I don't encourage the reading of his works in general, but as in many of the degenerate British uh, intellectuals, he is somewhat insightful on this. And here's what he wrote on the special relationship. This relationship is really at bottom a transmission belt by which British conservative ideas have infected America, the better then to be retransmitted back to England. The process of transmission has been made easier, admittedly, by those Americans who are themselves receptive to the temptations of thinking with the blood, in other words, class interests, or the temptations of empire, or the temptations of class and caste superiority. But it was always in the British mind to press these ideas upon them. Now, he writes that during World War II, the British Security Coordination, which was an institution set up by Churchill and Sir William Stevenson, the man who organized U.S. intelligence, they wrote about this attempt to shape American thinking during the war. And they said the Americans are still unsure of themselves, still basically on the defensive and still striving after national unity. And it goes on to say that British self-confidence about American vulnerability on these scores was based on a careful appreciation of history. What do they mean by that? They, he, well, they, they meant that the United States could be manipulated after the attempts to defeat the United States militarily failed with our War of Independence, with the War of 1812, and the success of the Union in the Civil War, the British moved to subvert America through injection of these ideas. And that's what we see still today. The idea of the Great Reset, where does that come from? It's the City of London. Wall Street is in lockstep with the City of London. The corporate financial cartels, the offshore banking tax havens run by the City of London. This is absolutely central to U.S. economic policy. The globalized free trade policy came from the British. This is the Adam Smith policy. And so we're watching the United States head over the cliff, both in terms of the bankruptcy from these endless wars and from the deindustrialization of the U.S. economy, directed by the British. So when those of you who question why does LaRouche talk about the British, 
Study this a little bit. Look at the ideas of Mackinder. Look at what got us into World War I, what led the world into World War II, into the Cold War, and into the post-Cold War bubble economy, which was based on the idea that with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Western interests could loot the whole world with impunity. Now, what stands in the way of that? Sovereign nations such as Russia, China, and the impulse in the United States, which was represented by the Trump victory in 2016, to break with those policies. Now today, with the pulling out of troops from Afghanistan, we have an opportunity to end the reliance on such British ideas as the arc of crisis and the great game. And I would encourage people to read a really important strategic memo written by Helga Zepp-LaRouche on breaking with the policy of geopolitics and what the potential is were the United States to join, as her husband had proposed, with the four powers, India, Russia, China, and the United States, against the British system, against the International Monetary Fund and World Bank, against the idea of a, a global strike force to defend the rules-based order, and instead go back to the traditions and principles embedded in the American Constitution and the bedrock of our republic. That republic, remember, was forged in a war against the British Empire. And it's a stain on our national honor that we have again embraced the strategic policy of the British Empire instead of our own hallowed traditions. So thanks for joining me today and I'll see you again tomorrow.